We're grateful for your presence this morning. And we're grateful that we can be together. And this may be said a lot, but it's certainly true that we can gather here freely without people, government or whatnot, trying to stop us and even willing to persecute us for worshiping according to the truth of the New Testament. That has not always been the case in this world, and it's not the case in many places today. If you ask the average person about the church, what it is, you're going to get, if there's much knowledge at all, the idea that it is denominational. That's all people know about the church. You've got this denomination, that denomination, another denomination, and however many there are, I don't know today. They used to say back in the 50s there were 350 denominations in America. Well, that's far more than that today. But why did people ever form the view of denominational Christianity? If you just read your New Testament and take the knowledge God gave us from His Son by the Holy Spirit, you won't come up with that concept. And the concept is all of these different churches serve to make up the one church. Now, the way they will describe it is when you say there's one body they make a distinction between the one body of Christ and the churches. They think, if they know anything at all, which many times today they don't, they think that the different churches that acknowledge God and Christ and the Bible, they think that it makes up the one body of Christ, or they make up the one body of Christ. But again, I simply say, where in the New Testament do you ever read of such a thing? So the church really today is just an unknown entity as far as the way it is revealed on the pages of the New Testament. It is incumbent then upon the Lord's people, the church, the kingdom of God, the family of God, the body of Christ, in carrying out the commission that Christ gave to us in preaching the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15, that we understand that to preach the gospel is to preach on the church. It has bothered me all my life that so many people have dwelt upon the plan of salvation when they did, but they didn't show the connection as clearly as they ought to between that and the church. So Jesus made a promise in Matthew 16, 18. He keeps his promises. I will build my church, C-H-U-R-C-H, -H, one church. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, you find where he built it. You find the gospel being preached in its fullness. People receiving the message and believing it realizing that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of God, understanding they had sinned when they crucified Him, and then crying out because of their hearts being pricked by the truth, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the Apostle Peter tells them as believers in Christ, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is unto you and to your children and all them that be far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And we find then that those that gladly received his word were baptized. And then we find they were added to the church by the Lord himself. 41, 42, and 47 of Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> When a person is obedient to the gospel, he hears the gospel, he understands it, he applies it to his life, 
He's convicted of sin, knows he stands lost before God and in need of salvation that comes only through Christ. He believes in Christ through the evidence contained in the preaching of the gospel. He then is caused to obey Acts 17.30, which is to repent of sins, which is to resolve the heart to no longer live as you want to, but to submit to God, and that will be the way it will be the rest of your life. You'll be turning away from sin because of that resolve that said you died to the practice of sin at that point. You separate yourself from the habitual practice of sin. You no longer wanted to do that, and you resolve henceforth to live for the Lord. Then, Romans 10, 10, one confesses one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, one's trust, one's belief. And completing one's obedience to the gospel to become a Christian, one is immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. All sin is ultimately against God. It is God in heaven who forgives people's sins when they comply with his terms of pardon. As I said earlier, as Acts 2 records plainly, one is by the Lord himself, having obeyed the gospel, added to the church that he promised to build in Matthew 16, 18, and that he did do in Acts chapter 2. And throughout the book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament, you have all sorts of accounts of people being converted to Christ and some non-conversions. And they all heard the gospel, believed it, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, and were baptized into Christ. Significant, they're baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ. Paul makes that clear in Galatians 3 and verse 27. We're baptized into Christ. So when one is baptized to obtain remission of sins, so God will forgive him of his sins against him, all past sins, one is being baptized into Christ. Now Ephesians 1 and verse 3 tells us that all spiritual blessings are located in Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. But how do you get to where those spiritual blessings in heavenly places are? You're baptized into Christ as a penitent believer. So the church is made up of people who obey the gospel. How can you preach the terms of pardon for a person to become a Christian and not preach the institution wherein God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? And that is one of them being sonship, being a child of God. 1 Timothy 3 in verse 15 makes it clear that the house of God, which is the family of God, is the church of the living God. We've already seen from Ephesians 4, there's one body. And in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, we learn that the church is that body. And also Colossians 1, 18, the church is the body, the body is the church. There's one body, there's one church. And search, and you should, as hard as you can for a denominational concept of Christianity, you cannot find it in the Bible. You read of Jesus in John 17 praying that those who believe on him through the apostles' word would be one even as he is his father or one. Can you say denominationalism is that way? You see Paul rebuking the first inkling of division in the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.10 making it clear we ought to all be of the same mind and the same judgment. Is that true of denominational churches? And let me remind you what I said earlier, that each denominational church claims to be only a part. But the church the Lord built is the whole, and he adds everyone who is saved to it. And that's 1,500 long years before the first Protestant denomination appeared. That's important to understand. Paul would not have known what you're talking about when he said denominational Christianity. He wouldn't have known about all these different denominations as we know of them today, and they've been around for about 500 years. And they came into existence, most of them, at least the beginning of it all, in what's called the Protestant Reformation in Europe when they protested the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church. 
and they set about to try to change all of that. And yet what happened was it all turned into that many more denominations because the Roman Catholic Church is a denomination. It's an old denomination. Many may not know, but at one time it was just a Catholic Church. Catholic meaning universal. That's what the word Catholic means. Well, I'll tell you now, the Lord's Church is universal. It's worldwide. But when they say Roman Catholic Church, they're telling you something about how they came into existence because the um, priest in Rome, the bishop of Rome, claimed to be inheriting the position of Peter. And they think Peter's the prince of the apostles. And they claim that everybody submits to him. And there was a great division in the Catholic Church. It became the Eastern Orthodox Church because they would not acknowledge the Pope at Rome as being the head of the church. So if you're Roman Catholic, they know immediately what you mean. You acknowledge the Pope in Rome as the head. So all that came to being. There was a Coptic church in Egypt that's very old and maybe some others. That was long before what we know today as denominationalism began, and that was in the Protestant Reformation of the 15th, 1600s in Europe. And what was interesting about that, some of the people who protested and had a pretty good idea, they didn't understand restoring the church over and against what it was to reform the church. Because if you reform a church not sanctioned by God in the first place, it may be reformed, but it's still not sanctioned to God. It's just a reform, not sanctioned of God church. They never seemed to understand that you could take the blueprint, infallible blueprint, which is the last will and testament of Christ, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, and start with that and build the church from that blueprint. Anytime in the world anybody wants to be a Christian, such as Paul was, all they have to do is go to the New Testament and study it, learn how those things, people became Christians. That same seed will bring forth the same fruit. And when you preach the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, people believe it and understand it and obey it, then you'll have the same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost when the church started, when the gospel was first preached in its fullness. But what happened then in Europe in 1500s, 1600s, people like Luther and Calvin and a number of others thought they would reform, and they did not, most of them, and Luther in particular, they did not want there to be a church named after him, made it clear. But those who were his followers after his death went ahead and did what so many followers do and carried even further than what maybe a founder would, and though they changed it to the Lutheran church. And Baptist churches of various descriptions were formed. And the Methodist church came along in the 1700s. Presbyterian church formed out of Calvin teaching and so forth. All right. Go back to the first century. Go back to your New Testament. You still have your New Testament. You can read and understand it. And you'll never find anything like that regarding the church. Because all these churches will pretty much say, well, yeah, we're all headed to heaven a different way, but we'll all get there. You can't find that in the Bible either. Well, why think it? Why think it's so? Why do you think God accepts it? if you can't find it in his infallible word, which, remember, was given to instruct us in righteousness. Well, it doesn't instruct us in that way concerning the church. It instructs you right the opposite way. If you read your New Testament, it is constantly in one way or the other explicitly, that isn't just so many words, or implicitly, making it very clear that God expects everybody to be united of the same mind and the same judgment under the one headship Jesus Christ, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. He is the only head of the church. There's not another. And when we consider that, I would like for you to note one of the most vivid descriptions of the church, and it's found in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 32. The scripture reads, Wives, be in subjection unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives also be to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word, that he might present the church to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Even so ought husbands also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as Christ also the church. Because we are members of his body. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Now here's the summation of all of it right here. This mystery is great. It's a great mystery. Mystery meaning unrevealed. We don't understand all about it. But what are you talking about, Paul? But I speak in regard to Christ and his church. Obviously, the church was meant to be something wherein all the members are united as to what one must do to be saved in the gospel system and what one must do to be faithful to God in the church. It covers the organization of the church. When a church is organized, it has elders or pastors or bishops. There's different terms in the Greek that's used to refer to those men who must meet certain qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 that the church goes by to select men to do the work of elders. In the churches of Christ, we commonly call them elders. Uh, they're pastors too. And that causes me to stop and say, if you look at the denominational world, they violate what the New Testament teaches about the organization of the church. And they will call their preachers because they are preachers, pastors. You'll never find that in the New Testament. Now, can a preacher serve as an elder? Yes, if he qualified. And he would be a pastor in that sense. But he's not a pastor simply on the basis of being a preacher. But the denominational people look at that preacher as the one who's the shepherd over that flock. That's not the way the Bible teaches it. That's a departure from the truth of the New Testament. It's not speaking as the oracles of God, and yet we're charged by Peter, if any man speak. Let him speak as the oracles of God. So when you see their elders to direct what God obligates the church to do, to choose the quickest and best way possible to discharge those obligations, then you have deacons to serve. Deacon from diakonos, which means a servant, one who hastens to get done the job assigned. I like to think of deacons as right-hand men of the elders. They are the ones who meet certain qualifications too, 1 Timothy 3. They must meet them to become deacons. I might mention deacons, become a deacon is not a stepping stone to becoming an elder. Never was thought of that way. People might think of it that way, and some members have, but that's not what the Bible teaches. They may, somebody may be appointed as a, from being a deacon to becoming an elder, but that's not a stepping stone to becoming an elder any more than a preacher is a stepping stone. Well, a preacher might be a stepping stone to step out and go when he has to. But, but uh, they're all independent one of another to do the work the Lord assigned them in the church. So elders need to understand their duty and their obligation and that they do have one and the church has a right to expect out of them things that help them be what the church is meant to be. Deacons have a right to expect out of the elders' direction and to get done what ought to be done. And it all ought to be done if it ought to be done in obligation as quickly and the best way possible. So there's the way the church is set up. Teachers are there to teach, preachers, elders, deacons. A church can't exist for a while without being fully organized because men may not be qualified to be elders. But the point is, God didn't expect it to always be that way with any church. He expected people to mature spiritually, and for people to become elders and to be organized like the God through the Holy Spirit revealed it should be. And the church worships then like the New Testament teaches. It's to worship God in spirit and in truth under the authority of Christ. And we're to do all things under or by the authority of Christ. Colossians 3.17 Thus we worship as the Lord wants us to worship. He knows how he wants to be worshipped. That is God does. Why do I want to try to worship him as it suits me? I'm here to please him. 
If we would assemble in worship assemblies with a total idea, I'm here to please him. I'm here to do his will. I'm here to worship him on his terms. It'd change all sorts of things. But you look around about you at what people call worship. It becomes anything from a three-ring circus to a dog and pony show and everything designed to please people. But that's not the way it is. For the faithful Christian who's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and seeking to bring every thought and subjection to Christ, he's assembling because the Bible authorized him to assemble on the first day of the week. And in that assembly, worship God as he designates all to be done on the first day of the week. And that involves singing, it involves the Lord's Supper, it involves prayer, it involves teaching, and so on. And giving of our means. Those are the things authorized. Why don't you do more? Not authorized. Well, why are you so concerned about authorization? Colossians 3.17 and a host of other things were to do the Lord's will. The whole problem with most people when it comes to becoming a Christian, as the Bible defines that, or even in listening and understanding and studying the Bible, they don't like what they hear because they've got their minds set to do something else. And those outside the church in the denominations are those not connected with anything as far as the church is concerned. They're not the only ones. While the church couldn't apostatize if people hadn't heard the gospel, obeyed it, and then decided to leave it. Paul warns that when it comes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. You can't depart from something unless you're in it. So they heard the gospel, believed, and obeyed it. No reason to believe they weren't Christians. But some departed from it, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And he gives some of the specific early departures from the truth after that. So there's an adherence to the truth, a battle in the church to keep everybody doing only what the New Testament teaches Christians ought to do. And we even divine Christians. As the New Testament does, if you walk around today and uh, you were to talk to the average person who would be involved in something to do with the God of the Bible, the Bible is the Word of God in Christ, they would say, I'm a Christian. Well, what church are you a member of? You know, in the first century, if you were to say, I'm a Christian, you would have to ask what church you're a member of. They'd know it would be Christ church. Are you a member of Christ church? Yes. They wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to tell them you were a Christian. They'd know you were a Christian. The word Christian means of Christ. If you become a Christian, you're of Christ. Well, that fits perfectly in the fact that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And you're baptized into Christ. So your sins are remitted when you are, your alien sins, the sins that originally separated you from God. They're forgiven, and now you're in the church. And there you're expected to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Where? Here's our in the Lord again. In the Lord. People may do wonderful and marvelous things to help other people, but if they're outside of Christ, it is not taken note of by God. We must understand that we will give an account before the judgment seat of Christ of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, if you've been living a faithful Christian life and all the New Testament teaches about being faithful, You'll know then that you're living under the authority of the Lord. You're keeping the word of Christ. The word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, to use a part of a verse. And to dwell in you richly is that you're constantly concerned about setting your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. You're seeking to bring every thought to subjection to Jesus Christ. You're willing to confess your sins when you commit them. You have an attitude always that you need the blood of Christ cleansing you, and you have a tender heart, and you're seeking to become more like Christ every day. You're engaging in prayer according to the teaching of the Bible because that's one of the blessings of being a Christian. You can pray to God, and He is your Father. And through Christ, who's the only mediator between God and man, you can approach Him because you're in Christ. And He's promised to answer all your prayers. And the attitude of your mind is... Not my will, but thine be done. 
because you realize he's all-knowing, he's all-loving, he wants you in heaven with him, he's given his son, the gospel's been given, it's the power of God to save. You have from the heart honestly obeyed that gospel, you know the Lord by the word of God has added you to the church, and he's not going to do anything that's going to hurt you. Everything that the word of God has in it is to lead you to heaven, to guide you to heaven. Yeah, but it, it, it upset me because I have to give up this or I have to start doing that. Well, when you rear your children, you love them like normal parents ought to love them. You hold things back from them. And you make them do certain things. They may not like it. Now, you think of your upbringing. I don't know what it was like. But I promise you there were things you had to do that you didn't necessarily want to do and you didn't like. You know, one of the things that always comes to mind in my life is when I was sick, I think when I was little, they made medicine just specifically liquid medicine to taste as bad as anything possible you could put in your mouth. But when I was sick, it didn't make any difference how much I protested. Mama got that tablespoon of whatever that awful stuff was down my throat, and she wasn't going to let me get by without it. Well, I didn't want to do that. Didn't like it. I was sick. I'd known better, but I was a kid. So she did for me what I didn't have sense enough at that time to do for myself. She made me take the medicine, even though it tastes bad. Now, is that hard to make that application as children of God and the family of God concerning the things that we need and God knows better for us? Thus we say in our prayers, not our will, but thy be done. And we're always striving to do his will. And so that is the church. The church is a very simple thing. You humble your heart and you receive with meekness the engrafted word, the gospel, the seed of the kingdom, the sword of the spirit. You understand it. You believe it. You change your mind for the rest of your life to serve Christ. You do what he requires of being baptized into Christ as a penitent believer. And you live like the New Testament said and you worship like the New Testament says with other people of like precious faith who have believed and obeyed the same gospel. There it is. Now look at denominationalism. There's no telling what goes on. Most of it, do as they please. In fact, that's how denominationalism stands. You go to your church, I go to mine, we all get together. together. I like this one over here better. The idea is you believe in Christ, he's my Savior, I call on him the Savior to save me. When I think he has, I say, which church do I want to be a part of? And nowadays, some people say, well, I don't want to be a part of any church, but I've accepted him to be my Savior. And so people have the false concept that floats around all over the place of the church and its connection to man's salvation. Listen to me, and I beg of you by the mercies of Christ. There are no faithful Christians outside of the church of Christ as that term is used and defined in the New Testament. How do I know that? Because the Lord added the saved to the church. Now, if you think of the church strictly as a denomination, You'll say, well, you mean you feel folks think you're the only ones going to heaven? Well, I can tell you right now, some of them aren't because they won't remain faithful. But if you think of the denominational concept where all these different churches make up the one body, well, if I thought, if that was the case, I'd say, well, why do you think your denomination is better than mine? But I've never been a member of a denomination, and I never will be. But I'm a member of the Lord's church. There are some people who have been members of the denominations, but they gave it up when they knew it wasn't taught in the Bible and they became members of the Lord's church when they obeyed the gospel. They understood the truth of God's word. And folks, if the truth of the New Testament of Jesus Christ doesn't mean more to you than life itself, you'll never go to heaven. Well, does that mean you're going to be perfect in living it? It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect in the sense there will never be something for you to correct. But it means you can be complete in that you've obeyed the gospel, you've been added to the church, and you're living faithful in the church. It's obvious one grows in greater knowledge and practice of the truth. The New Testament, most of it, as we've said umpteen times, however many that is, is written to Christians to correct them and to guide them. So when you're baptized into Christ, born of water and the Spirit, added to the church by the Lord Himself, a citizen of the kingdom of God, you're in the position of growing. And that's the reason a person baptized into Christ is called a babe in Christ. 
And it's the reason we're taught to grow as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Why don't people grow in greater knowledge and understanding of what real genuine New Testament Christianity is? They don't desire the sincere milk of the word. They might desire uh, no telling what about athletics or about their job or about their family. But the reason they don't know is they don't know their Bible. And the Old Testament writer comes to mind, no zeal, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How could there ever be a leaving, anyone leaving the faith, if they didn't cease to be unconcerned about the tenets of faith, the gospel system, the New Testament? Something had to become more important to them than that which they once believed and obeyed to become Christians. But the church, as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, is a very simple thing. From the standpoint of describing it, you simply as an individual hear and understand the gospel and humble yourself and obey the gospel as we've gone over more than once this morning. The Lord adds you to all others who've done the same way. You seek their fellowship because you've all been reconciled to God. You're in fellowship with God and you seek to continue to follow the authority of Christ to set out the word of God concerning Christian conduct and worship. Here's the church. Man comes along and sets up all sorts of hierarchies, comes up with all sorts of manuals, catechisms, prayer books, and disciplines, comes up with all kinds of worship, uh, all sorts of things go on. And yet the Bible sets it out so simple and so clear, but man has to clutter it all up. Now, why do that? Why do that? Jesus is the head of his church. There is no other. So why should you be a member of the church that has some other head? There are no earthly headquarters of the church. It's not in Dallas, Texas, Houston, Nashville, or anywhere else on earth. It's not in Jerusalem. Where is the headquarters of the church? Where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God ruling. That's the headquarters of the church. Where is the will of our king, our sovereign king, in his last will and testament, the New Testament of the Bible? Perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Is it important? Jesus says so. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. We already know how God's going to operate at the, at the judgment through Christ. You think he's going to change the meanings of the New Testament? Now it's going to be something if we all get there. Isn't this a wonderful God we serve? We all get there. And he says, ha ha, fooled you. I'm going to judge you by the Koran. I don't serve God like that. He's going to judge us by the will of Jesus Christ. Thus we know ahead of time what's right and wrong in God's eyes. And that's what we operate by. The perfect law of liberty. He who continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. His deed is his actions, his works, because they're authorized by God from the perfect law of liberty, Colossians 3.17. Christ is the Savior of the church, and the church is not a denomination. I don't know of any denomination, I'm not saying there aren't out there, but I don't know of any denominations, and I know most of them don't, even teach the complete plan of salvation. And if they do, they don't teach that when you do that, the Lord adds you to his church. They don't believe that. But the Bible teaches it. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Christ is the Savior of the church. 2 Timothy 2.10, as Christ also is the head of the church, being himself the Savior of the body. But there's only one body, Ephesians 4, and that body is the church, Colossians 1.18. And he promised to build one church, Matthew 16.18. And he did, Acts chapter 2. And he added people to it who humbled themselves, believed the gospel, and obeyed it. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread, and in prayers, Acts 2.42. We do too, under the authority of Christ, if we're Christians, and if you're Christians, you're members of that one church. And that ought to be understood. Christ loves the church because it's his bride. Christ sacrificed himself for the church. 
Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So, are we in teaching people the truth concerning how to be forgiven of sins and becoming Christians, understanding ourselves as we ought, how that people are baptized into Christ, which means into the church, the one body, the family of God. We become citizens of the kingdom of heaven, born of water and the spirit, John 3, verse 3 and verse 5. And we're setting our minds completely upon following the New Testament in worship and in daily living and in all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, God's even set up a way for us as members of the church to be forgiven. Upon repentance of a sin, we commit our sins and confession of those sins and praying to Him for forgiveness. He makes it clear we're forgiven. And therefore, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. And we're taught plainly in those verses following that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's a great second plan of pardon. There must be, therefore, always a humble disposition of mind in approaching God through the Word of God that we will receive the truth and correct whatever there is to be corrected. Why will we rebel against such a simple thing? But that's what denominationalism has done to the simplicity of the gospel and the church. But we set forth the truth. And if anybody can find where I've taught anything this morning contrary to the New Testament, I'd be more than happy for you to show me. I don't know. We're living in a day and time when doctrine is just simply unimportant. It's just not very important, even to members of the church. So you're apt to go off after everything when doctrine is not important. Doctrine is teaching. I'm speaking of the doctrine of Christ. Whoso goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, neither receive him into your house, nor bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deed. And that's very plain in Second John. We have an obligation then to uphold the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the gospel concerning how you become a Christian, what a Christian is, what sin is, how you gain forgiveness of sins, and the institution to which Christ adds all those who become Christians. And this organization and its work and its worship. And I say again in closing, it's quite simple. So if you're subject to the invitation of Christ to become a Christian, or to repent of sins as an erring child of God, we invite you to come to Him while now we stand and sing.